Welcome back to our little office interview here. And we'll talk about waves today. Again, uh, we'll talk about partial differential equations. And this will be the first lecture on waves. And there are many different kind of waves. Uh, we'll talk about realistic waves. Today we'll talk particularly about waves on a string. Okay? But then next lecture will include gravity and will include friction, which makes it more realistic and more interesting. And then beyond that, we'll talk about other kinds of waves as well. So this is just the beginning. OK. So we'll talk about the numerical solution of wave equations. But we'll actually do a, a few derivations as well, analytically, to derive appropriate wave equation. What do we mean when we talk about a wave equation? Well, there's actually lots of different wave equations. We're talking about waves being a solution of some equation like this. And we'll say y, vertical position, because we'll deal with one-dimensional waves predominantly here. And that position, the disturbance, one-dimensional, could be multi-dimensional, is a function of both space and time. And that's the critical thing. We have space, well, just x coordinate if it's 1D in time. And a wave is what? Well, a wave is a signal that travels through space. Simple as that. So if it's a signal, it's a disturbance, and that's what we mean by y. And if it travels through space, that means space is x, and it's traveling. It's going from one place to another. So different times, the wave moves along. So that being said, and I said it, uh, there are many different wave equations. Any equation that produces a solution that looks like a function of both position and time could well be a wave, and that then is a wave equation. So we'll talk about the standard wave equation. First, the, the one you see in the textbooks, waves on a string. Then we'll talk about how you solve this numerically. And the technique will be one we've used already. We use for the heat equation. Uh, we time stepping. We'll find the solution at one time, then we'll move it ahead step by step, leap frogging forward in time until we get the solution to what any, every time in the future we want. Okay? It's a fairly standard technique. It's not necessarily the most efficient, but it works very well. One of the interesting things we'll do after the first preliminary one dimensional lectures is we'll talk about quantum wave packets. Okay? So, quantum waves obviously come from the Schrodinger equation, the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. So there are other kinds of waves, different equation. And we'll show how to solve the Schrodinger equation for complex waves with real and imaginary parts. So the amplitude then has two components. We'll then move ahead and say, what about if we have electromagnetic waves? Well, electromagnetic waves are waves that have a disturbance in space and time. But the disturbance is both an electric field and a magnetic field. Both of those are vector fields, so it's actually six component wave traveling through space. And we'll talk about how you solve the equations for that. So obviously, that part gets more complicated. The basic solution of the equations is pretty much the same. And finally, our last examples about waves will be the kind of waves you see in computational fluid dynamics, CFD. So we'll talk about water waves, waves which have dispersion, shock waves and ultimately solitons. So what do we have here on the bottom of the screen? If you see there, it, it's a catenary. We'll talk about that. But it looks like a wire, a chain, hung between two endpoints, which it is, uh, under the influence of gravity. So gravity makes it sag in the middle. You know, it must be a middle-aged chain. So if you look at this chain, if you disturb it, you'll get a wave. Excuse me. There we go. We started it off. OK. And what you're seeing here is a wave on a chain. So it looks realistic, but it also includes friction. So if you wait, you see that the disturbance dies away in time. So we'll solve equations like this. It has both a, see if we can get it to, there we go. Come on. It has both a time dependence. This is a standing wave. It, it's realistic because it has a catenary, which means the tension is not constant. And it dies away with time, which means it has friction. OK, so let's go on, if it lets us go on. Here's our standard wave on a string setup. Take a look at it. Make sure you know what the variables mean. OK, 
So, we, you've seen waves, you, you can go do some yourself, where you just have a stretched string and you pluck it like a guitar. You get a standing wave pattern, you can make traveling waves, you can have superposition, whatever. You send pulses down the string. So here's our string. We have heavy blocks at the end, so the ends can't move. The string is tied down at the end. The string has length L here, okay? And then X is the position. Actually, X is the position from one end to the other here. So this is positive X. X equals zero. X equals L. Fine. And then the disturbance is just the height from the equilibrium position. If we ignore uh, gravity, then the equilibrium position is this horizontal line. So Y is the height above the horizontal line. It should just be a one-sided arrow. Okay, that's the height up because that's positive Y. If y, if y is down below, that's negative and that's positive. Okay, and it, it changes. Y changes with position and it changes with time, as we've seen. So that's the basic setup. Rho is the density of the string, the mass per unit length. And that's assumed to be a constant here. It won't have to be in the future, but we'll keep things simple. T is the tension. That's the force that we're pulling on the string, or we stretched it and tied it down. That's also assumed to be constant. And to be realistic, we're saying the tension is very, very high compared to the force of gravity. So the string, when there's nothing stretching it, is horizontal rather than sagging. It could sag a little bit, but it's minuscule. Okay? And likewise, there's no friction. So, the other assumption, which we violate in this picture here, but that's sort of pedagogical license, is we assume the displacements are very small, which means y, the displacement here, is going to be much, much less than l. Well, here y, y is at least less than l, but not much, much less than, not 100 or 1,000. But it should be in order for the equations we're talking about to be realistic. So, let's go ahead and do something. Let's look at the next slide. Slide number nine. Okay, so on the left we have that same image you saw before, but now only made smaller so it can strain your eyes a little bit. And what we're saying is y, the height, is always small compared to length l. Well, if that's true, then the slope at any point which is dy by dx. That's just the definition of slope, the change in height with distance. Partial derivatives. Why partial? Well, because there's also time dependence. So we have partial derivative. Okay? So that's the slope. And we are, we are assuming the slope is also small, which would be true if y was very small, so that we can replace sine theta with theta is the angle, as we have here on the right, the angle that the uh, string makes with the horizontal, you know, so that's theta in here. Okay, you know, so there's theta here. Here's also, you know, here's another theta. Okay, so the slope is the theta dy by dx, or approximately sine theta or tangent theta, because all three are approximately equal for small angles. Okay. So next, we go ahead here and we say, let's isolate a small element of the string. So this is, you know, this part over here on the right where it's coming to the end. So here's a little piece of the string. The little block here means that this was the element we're looking at. It has some mass, and it's at, an, it's at an angle theta. This is delta x, and this is delta y, incremental small variations in position and height. And there must be a restoring force. Okay. Do you remember the, talking about restoring forces? When you spoke about simple harmonic motion, you always spoke, learned about restoring force. And it means exactly what it says. It means there's a force which tends to restore the system to its equilibrium configuration. That's nice, OK? So what does it on the string? Well, the equilibrium configuration is just this horizontal dashed line on the left here. And what restores it is the tension. So if we have this little element of mass we've isolated, if the tension in the y direction, the vertical direction, was the same on both sides, this thing would stay there. But there must be a difference in tension. And that difference in tension is enough to make the mass move up and down. 
And that's an important point here. When you're talking about these one-dimensional waves, we're only talking about vertical motion. We're assuming there's no horizontal motion. That would be a different kind of wave. So the restoring force is just going to be the difference in the y component of the tension. When we're done, we're not done yet. Don't jump ahead. When we're done, we'll, we'll get a speed c for the wave propagation speed. Okay? And we'll see that's the square root of the tension over the density. The important point here, while we're just talking about geometrical objects, is that this string c, the velocity of the wave on the string, is not the velocity of the string. The velocity of the string at any point here is the speed at which this thing moves up and down. Okay? So this thing moves up and down here, not with velocity c, but with dy, dy, dy by dt. Okay, close it up. Okay. Because y is the vertical position, and how that changes in time is the velocity of the string. So the velocity of the string at any point is dy by dt. The string velocity, the wave velocity on the string, will derive is the square root of the tension divided by the density. And that makes sense. We may as well say it now. Because that says if you make the tension higher, you pull it tighter, boom, it vibrates more quickly, faster speed. And if you make the string heavier, denser, increase rho, slows down the propagation velocity. So that being said, let's derive the wave equation. The basis of the wave equation is f equals ma. And I tell students, you don't really have to ever uh, memorize the wave equation, or even memorize its derivation, all you have to remember is just f equals ma. The rest is pretty straightforward. So it's such an easy derivation, it's worth going through here. Likewise, not only is it easy, when we include friction and other forces, we'll just repeat the same derivation with other forces present and see what happens. So that's how we generalize the wave equation. Okay, so f equals ma, fine. What's f? f is just the sum of all the forces in the y direction. Good. What's m? m is just the density rho, which is the mass per unit length, times the length we're talking about delta x. Fine. It could be delta x plus delta y squared, but delta x is what we're doing. And that's equal to the acceleration in the y direction, which is d squared y by dt squared. So that's pretty easy. Okay, That's just f equals ma. Now we just take that same equation and say, what are the forces in the y direction? Well, the forces in the y direction are two. If we move to x plus delta x, so as we move along here, and the signs may be backwards, but we'll just stick with them, assume they're positive. If they're negative, we just get a restoring force, which is what's going to happen for this element here. Okay? So it's the force at x plus delta x on this side the upward force, which is just the tension times sine of theta at this point, minus the tension times sine of theta at position x. So the whole point here is we're just looking at the difference in tension at this point, which is pulling down, and the difference in tension at this point, pulling down. Okay? So because they're not equal, we get a net restoring force. So we get sine of theta at x plus delta x minus sine of theta at x. Well, what is that? t is the same on both. Sine of theta at x plus delta x is just the first derivative, the slope, dy dx evaluated at x plus delta x. And sine of theta at x is just the slope, sine of theta, dy dx evaluated at x. So we just have the tension, this constant. But what is the difference in the first derivative? Well, the difference in the first derivative is just the second derivative times delta x. Okay, so we get this is just d squared y by dx squared. Okay, there's no delta x here because we just have it's just the differences here. Yeah. There is actually a delta x which is left out here. I said it correctly. Okay, so let's just feel, so the and there should be a delta x here. Delta x, I'm putting it in. Okay, there it is. There is a delta x, 
And as we'll see here, there's a delta x up above on both sides of the equation, so that'll cancel out. Okay, so the difference in y with delta x is just the second derivative times delta x. Fine. So, we made a, it's good to think on your feet when you do this. Gee, I wish I was able to. So, when we're done, we just substitute, we have the wave equation. F equals ma. We have d squared y by dx squared, the change in y, the second derivative of y, the vertical position with respect to horizontal, is some constant, 1 over c squared, times d squared by dt squared. So, remember, d squared by dt squared is just, that's just f equals ma, so that's the acceleration, and this comes about because the tension varies. And 1 over c squared, c here is just t rho, so that's just 1 over t rho, or rho over t. But that's the constant, we usually leave it in there, that's the velocity of the wave. Fine, that's the wave equation. So, let's now look at this equation and how we have to apply it for this particular problem. So, equation one is the wave equation. What can we say about it? Let's look at it. Well, it's obviously a partial differential equation because we have y here, we have x, one variable, and t, another independent variable. So, we have a dependent variable y and two independent variables. That's a partial differential equation. Okay? It's also a second order equation rather than first, so we have two kinds of uh, conditions we have to know about, two pieces of information in order to solve this equation. And, it, okay. and in addition to being smart enough to figure out how to s solve it. So, one condition has to be the initial condition. Okay, and that's just one condition. It won't be enough, but at least it's a star. So we imagine here the initial condition is a triangular pull. So here it's saying we're starting with the string up like that, and we're letting go, and it's falling down. So this is the triangular pull. So we have you know the string coming up like that and going down. Okay? So at x equals to point, uh, point 0.8L, point 0.8L, here, okay, is where we have the pluck. That's the height. So we have a linear part going up to that point, positive slope. And then we have another line translated, so that's this five might with a negative slope there coming down. Okay? So that's the initial pluck. So that's good. Okay? But that's not enough information. A second order equation needs two pieces of information. So this we need a second initial condition in order to solve this. Hmm. What could that be? Well, we've said that this is our string. We're starting with a pluck, and we're letting go. Well, that's it. That's the condition. I'm letting go from rest. Okay? I'm not pulling it at, at letting go. Letting it go from rest. So the second condition is that we're letting go of the string at rest. So we're pulling it up and let, letting it go at rest. So dy by dt, the vertical velocity with respect to time, is equal to zero at zero for the entire length of the string, for all values of x. Okay? So, should we go ahead and solve this equation? Well, we could, but the picture I showed you, remember those two golden heavy blocks at the end, meant that we put other conditions on this problem. We've put boundary conditions. We've said that the wave is tied down at its ends for all time. So, we have to satisfy those conditions as well. And this might be bothering you. I know it used to bother me a lot, but now I don't let anything bother me. But it, what it's saying is we have two conditions we must know, two pieces of information we must know in order to find the solution of this equation, and those are the two initial conditions. Okay? Second order equation, two pieces. And now we're saying this further information we're demanding. Well, that's making this an eigenvalue problem. That's saying Yes, there's more conditions than there are degrees of freedom in the equation. There may or there may not be a solution, but we'll look in order to see if we can find a solution that satisfies everything. Okay. So these, are, these boundary conditions are extra conditions. They may or they may not lead to a solution. Okay. So let's go ahead 
and looks, let's look at the standard normal mode solution. So, take a break. Look. Now, the normal mode solution is the analytic solution that you read about in books. It's analytic, but as is often the case with what's called so-called analytic, it's an infinite series, which is not exactly analytic and not exactly uh, something you can manipulate very easily. But it has some good parts to it. So here we'll show you an applet. Allow it. So here's one of our applets. Okay. So this is one of the applets of a normal mode. And a normal mode can be started anyway. So here we have what? We can, we can have different modes. And this is each mode. Two humps, one, one maximum, one minimum, just one hump. And here we can have different heights. So let's keep the height up high. And if you start one hump, you see that this hump just goes back and forth. These are standing waves. That's what the normal mode solutions are. These are each of the normal modes. That's the single mode. That's the double mode. So let's go to the fourth mode. We start it. It also just bounces up and down. Your eye may think it's moving along right to left, but really all you're seeing is any one point is just moving up and down. You know, if we decrease the amplitude, it doesn't move quite as much. So let's stop this baby. Stop and get back. So th that's what normal modes look like. How do you get normal modes out of the wave equation? We take our standard wave equation, we assume a separable solution. We assume that the function y of both x and t is a separate function of position, capital X, and a separate function of time, capital T. And now the rest is standard. I won't go through all the details here. We substitute this separable form into the wave equation. We then divide by the solution, y. And then we say we get two separate equations, one involving time only, the other involving space only. And they both seem to be equal to each other. And we're saying the only way that could happen is if, because they could change otherwise independently, if they both were just equal to a constant. So we get two separate equations. We get equation for time d squared time by plus omega squared time, harmonic-like equation. And we get a, s a separate harmonic-like equation for space. And k and omega are related with the usual wave vector k equal to omega over c. So this is meant to be a review. How do you determine omega and k? Well, we have our boundary condition for our problem. The wave must vanish at the end. And that says that the solution of the x equation here which would be sines and cosines, can't have any cosine terms because they wouldn't vanish at the end. So we just have sine terms, and k must be equal to n plus 1 pi over l. must be some integer times pi over l in order to vanish at the ends. So then we have a time solution, which can involve also sines and cosines, since these are both harmonic equations. But then the second initial condition, the fact that the system at time zero must have no, be at rest means that the, the c term, which would give us an initial velocity because the, the derivative here with respect to time for the sine term would not vanish, the c must be zero. So we're left with our final condition. So equation four here is the standard standing wave solution. Okay? As I said before, it's an infinite series fine. Uh, and we need all terms. Each term is the product of space and the product of time. For a linear system, and a linear system is what we're solving so far, but some of the waves we talk about future won't be. For a linear system, the law of linear superposition holds. And that means that the most general solution, which is what we have here in equation 4, y of x and t, is an infinite sum of or linear superposition of individual solutions of normal modes, which are the individual solutions. Each normal mode can exist by itself. For a nonlinear system, you can't put it in a normal mode. It won't stay there. It'll jump around into other modes. If it's linear, it'll stay. So this is our linear system. This is our normal mode solution. 
we need to talk about this because this is the basic language and this of waves plus you want to see when you solve numerically whether you get solutions like this if you can set the system up in a normal mode then you know you've solved the same equation very good so let's move on and talk about how we solve this equation numerically okay how do we solve it numerically? Well, obviously, the way we solve all of these partial differential equations is we think of some grid. So here we have a solution, y, which is a function of x and t. So the grid must be in space and time. So here along the horizontal axis, the abscissa is x. And along the vertical axis, or the ordinate is time, time moving down. So time 0 is along the top we're moving down. That happens in this world, okay? And the just x and t values that we'll look for, look for solutions at are only those on the grid, okay? So it's not continuous x, continuous time, but just those on the grid. So x will be the first coordinate. We say i, delta x is the space step. j will be the second coordinate, which is time. j delta t is how far the steps are here. So obviously, the grid doesn't have to be the same size in both x and y, but I've just drawn it that way because I'm not a very good artist. Okay. What are the boundary conditions? Well, the boundary conditions are that the two ends are fixed. And so that means at x equals 0 here, and at x equals L there, the way we know the solution, it can't move. So that corresponds to these dots here with a white dot in the middle. So they look like jelly donuts or something, but they're really uh, just the boundary conditions. So these are the boundary conditions along the end. Okay? So that says that you can't uh, move the string there. We always know the solution here and, the, and here, and it always must be 0. Obviously, also means this is a terribly small grid. You might want hundreds or thousands of uh, dots in order to get a reasonable solution. But you'll, certainly for time, you'll want thousands, or hundreds at least. Uh, but we're making it small just so you can see it. Okay, Fine. But the top line also has these jelly donuts there. And what are they? Well, that's the initial condition. Top corresponds to time equals 0. And that says that's the initial condition. Okay? Time 0, we know the solution he here. We know the solution is, this, of course, this pluck. But we're not showing the pluck, but we know the value of x at all of those points. So we know the value of x at the top. We know the value of x at the ends. And so that's the initial conditions and the boundary conditions. So look at that. And ask yourself the question, remember how we solved Laplace's equation for electromagnetic field or just for the electric field? We used a relaxation technique, which was we said we knew the solution all around every place and then we just guessed what was inside and we just saw if it was a good solution. If not, we iteratively changed it until we got there. So can we use relaxation t technique here? And the answer is not really because we don't know the solution along the bottom. Okay? We, you know, we, we can try to guess the solution and see if it matches every place here, but we can't we have nothing to bring it in there. So it's a different way of doing it. So we can't use relaxation techniques. So let's see if we can figure out what we'll use. Okay? It's really straightforward. Numerically, you solve these almost always the same way. We just approximate the derivatives by some discrete form. So here, we'll use the central difference approximation for the second derivatives. So in equation one, we have two second derivatives. We have the time derivative on the left, and it has this characteristic time, which is the second coordinate. So there's a j plus 1 here, a j minus 1 there. They get added together. Then you subtract 2 of the guy in the middle. Fine. For the space coordinate, there's an i plus 1 first, then i minus 1. Then again, you subtract 2 of the guy in the middle, which is the same y i j, but it's for the i in the middle. And you divide by, in this case, the time, the space step. Okay. So, if we take equation 1, substitute into the wave equation, which was perfectly symmetric, we get equation 2, which is still perfectly symmetric in space and time. 
So this is quite nice. Equation two is, as it's called, the wave equation or the discretized form of the wave equation. Discretized meaning that we've replaced the continuous derivatives by something which would work on a discrete grid. So now we have to solve this baby. Hmm. It's a lot of I's and J's there to figure out how to solve it. So I don't know what to do. Let's look at the next slide. Maybe it'll help us. It does. OK, so look at the next slide. OK, so here we have the next slide. I don't know. It's a lot on there, Gene. We have on top the wave equation we're trying to solve. And what do we see? Well, we, we see here that we, we have the edges in time. We always know the time. For all time, we know what the solution is at x equals 0 and x equals l. And we know what the starting solution is. So we, what we'd like to do, just like the heat equation, is start at the top here at a known time and move forward. So let's look at that. If we look at that, we see, OK, we have j, we have j plus 1, that's the future. J minus 1, that's the past. And we have J, which is the present. On the left and on the right, we have J, J, J. That's the present. So we have future, one future, one past, two present. That's good. That we've done the hard part. I feel better. Okay? That says we can solve for the wave at the future, knowing what the wave was in the past and what it is now. That's our algorithm. So that's what this picture is going to show. It's saying we have this is the present, and there'll be, as you have here, three different x values involved. And then in the past, we have just the present x value, and, the, and all four of those can be used to predict the future. So that's what the algorithm will be. We, start, we have the present, the past. We use that to predict the future. We have the space parts coming in here for three different space parts at the present and only one space part for the past. Okay, so, so if, we, if we separate off the j plus 1 term here, which is the future, we're left with the algorithm. And notice two fascinating things here. One is we keep the c squared, which is the speed of sound on the string, the speed of the wave, and we have introduced another C called C prime. And C prime is just like an algorithm speed. It's delta x divided by delta t. Okay. And what that means is it's, it's just, it has the dimensions of a velocity. So we'll call it C. We'll put it a prime. But obviously, it has nothing to do with the physical velocity. But it's quite fascinating that this ratio, C prime, this sort of algorithmic velocity divided by the actual wave velocity, determines the stability of the system. Okay. The second fascinating thing which to remember is, as ri written here in equation 2 for the algorithm, we've broken the symmetry of the equation. The wave equation, or equation 1, was perfectly symmetric in i and j. And now we have equation which is not. And you can ask yourself, why is that? Well, the reason is because we have a, broke the symmetry in space by the initial conditions and the boundary conditions. We have two different initial conditions, but only one. I saw, sorry. We have two different boundary conditions, but only one initial condition. Two t space conditions, one time, and that breaks the symmetry of the problem. So the solution is no longer a symmetrical solution. Okay. So let's talk about the algorithm. Actually, I think I've probably said most everything. OK, so we'll, as outlined on the previous slide, this is a time-stepping algorithm. We'll start at some place here at the present. We'll take the past, the present values, predict the future. Fine. So it's a leapfrog method. We can't use relaxation because we just don't know the solution here, unless you can figure out a current. You, know, you could try figure out a way. I'll leave that as an exercise. What's very nice about this algorithm is as we can see in the picture here, we only need to store in the computer's memory at any one time three values. We just need one bat value for the past, three values for the present, one, and that predicts one value for the future. So we, you know, we, we might 
use thousands and thousands of time steps, but those can be written out the disk. They don't have to be in memory. We only need three values. So it's a very fast method. Okay, we only have to three at, uh, only have to store three the solution at three times, and the rest we just write out. It doesn't necessarily work very well unless you make the time step very small. And we'll see that in practice. So to get high precision, which is possible, you need very small time steps. Okay. The other problem is if you, you, if you need the past in order to predict the future, as well as the present, how do we get going? Okay. If we're over here, this is the present now, the initial condition. We want to predict the future. We don't know the solution at negative time. Okay. So we have to do something. And what we do is now we apply our initial condition and the central difference approximation. We said initially the wave, the string, is released at rest. So it's not moving. So dy dt for all x at time 0 is equal to 0. Okay, so the vertical velocity is zero. But dy dt is just y at delta t, and we're using a central difference approximation, minus y at minus delta t. So that gives you, when you sum these two up, you get zero. So on either side of zero, y must be zero. Or okay, well that's the, take the difference and get zero. So these two must be equal. So what this algorithm is telling us is, to get started, we can assume that we also have y equal 0 up there and y equal 0 at initial time. So at slightly negative time, the fact that the system was at rest means to this order of approximation, central difference, we go ahead. So the initially, we have that. OK, so let's look at slide 57. Uh, actually, this stability condition is fairly general. It's known by either the von Neumann stability condition or sometimes the Courant condition. And it's true for many wave equations of this sort. Uh, and it's a fascinating condition. So let's look into it. It's, it's also quite important. OK, so equation one here is the wave equation. Simple wave equation, waves on a string in the discrete form. And the general truth here, what you have to take home as your take-home lesson with these stability conditions, is that you can't just go about picking arbitrary values for delta x and delta t and get a stable solution. What you mean by stability here is that the solution doesn't blow up numerically. And obviously, if the solution blows up numerically, uh, it gets infinitely large, but the physical wave does not, then there's something wrong with the algorithm. It's not working. I mean, if the physical wave blows up, like in a shock wave, sometimes that's the right numerics as well. But generally, for these wave equations, you should have a traveling wave. The amplitude should not be growing in time, and it should be stable. So if you're not careful with delta x and delta t, you can end up with unstable solutions, and that's a numerical problem. Okay? So what the general technique is then you take whatever wave equation you're dealing with, in this case, equation 1, and you substitute what we have here in red, which is just a plane wave solution, but a discrete version of the plane wave. So we're saying that the solution at any grid point, any lattice point, m being space, j being time, ha is some amplitude c raised to the power j. OK, so that just says each time time goes on, we get a new amplitude. And then we have an exponential plane wave, e to the i, which is just traveling wave, k, which is some wave vector, m, which is the space coordinate, m delta x is just the position. Okay? So that's the basic solution, a plane wave in space. <clears throat> what we want to do is have a stable condition. But if this amplitude c is greater than 1 in magnitude, it could be a complex number, so we say magnitude. If it's greater than 1 in magnitude, then each step, each increasing j value, would lead to a bigger and bigger or growing amplitude, and then that would be unstable. So the condition c less than 1 is what we need for stability. And what uh, one of the references, press, 
proves is that in general for transport equations, the current condition, so obviously current proved this the first time, is that C, which is the physical speed of the wave, must be less than C prime, which is the what? C prime is this algorithmic velocity delta x delta t. So if you make C prime too small, then this condition will not be met. Uh, interesting. So how, if we make delta t smaller and smaller, the time step, then C prime gets larger and larger, it always gets better. So that's what I was telling you before. Typically, you make lots of little time steps. You make the time steps very small. The method always works. You won't get into trouble. I mean, there could be round off error accumulating. But uh, other than that, the method itself will be stable. But interestingly enough, if you make delta, t, delta x, the space step, smaller, thinking, ah, I'll make delta x smaller because that means the derivatives will be better. Well, no, if you make delta x smaller, then you're making c prime smaller. And at some prime, at some, at some time, c becomes smaller than c prime because delta x is small. And then you have an unstable solution. And you don't have to believe me or believe Courant or by Neumann even. Just try it yourself on your solution. That's an interesting thing. What's fascinating here, as I said before, is it's not symmetric. You know, we can make delta t as small as we want, but we can't make delta x as small as we want. How come delta t can get away with it and not delta x? Well, because the initial conditions and the boundary conditions are not stable. They're not symmetric, rather, so that they lead to difference. So it's not, we've, we've broken the symmetry there. So two sets of exercises for you. First, non-computational, see if you understand what's going on, and then computational. So, step well, first exercise, one, suggest an algorithm to solve the wave equation in one step. Okay, so we're solving it time stepping, we're solving it explicitly time by time. You know, see if you can solve it, boom, all at once, you know, for all possible times. How much memory would be required to do that? How much of the computer memory would you need? Is it reasonable? Uh, <clears throat> How does this compare to the memory needs for the leapfrog method, which only had three time? Okay. Now, see if you can think up some way of solving the wave equation using a relaxation method, like we did for Laplace's equation, where you just specify the solution, in this case, on three boundaries. You take the discrete form of the differential equation, and you just iterate till you get a solution. See if you can figure out a method like that to work. What would you use as your initial guess? How would you know once the procedure has converged? It's always important for an, an iterative solution. And how would you know if the solution is correct? So think about that. See what you can work out. Okay. Now, comp for your computational exercises, let's go ahead. So we give you on the CD or the DVD on web, wherever we give it to you, various programs, equation string. Okay. It's called. Here, this is a Python version, and I won't demonstrate it here. It just gives you the symbol to the waves we've just been showing you. So you'll be needing to understand this code well enough so you can modify it to include other physics in the future. But first, you need to make sure you understand that the algorithm works. Okay. So uh, run it for some typical cases. Here's a typical value of the density. Here's a good value of the tension. Here's a value for the space step size delta x, a cent ten hundredth of a centimeter. Obviously, you'll have to experiment. If you make delta x smaller, the technique should fail. Okay? Notice that in order for the technique to work, l equals 1, so y over l should be less than 1. Okay? Uh, that's not OK for the sample code here, where we just had 1, uh, so l equals 1. l equals 1,000 might be much better. Okay? But that being said, you know, we need y over l to be small in order for the wave equation to be accurate. The method still solves it. It's just not a very accurate description of nature, but probably accurate enough for what we're doing. So here's your real work. Take equation, string, get it running, whatever your language is, and now try to solve it. Okay. So go ahead, solve the wave equation, and then 
figure out, use some visualization technique to look at your solution. So here's there's two techniques. We already showed you a animation, the first slide, moving up and down. Make a surface plot. Look at the surface plot here in red. And what you see on the surface plot here is you see the initial wave right over here, very nice. And then that's the wave at time zero. We're setting, and then at later time, we see what happens to the wave. So this is a visualization in which there's friction because the wave dampens out. Yours would, wouldn't, so you'll have these bumps all over space-time. Animation is maybe easier but this captures to see, but this captures the whole thing. Explore different t space steps and different time steps and different combinations. You know, really check if the uh, stability conditions met. If you have an unstable solution, it can't possibly be accurate. So first you have to make sure that you get a stable solution. And it means, it might mean it doesn't, you know, just don't run a few steps. You may have to run a lot of steps to make sure it's stable because it may be growing each step, but you may not see the effect of that until later on. Okay? Now, for normal modes, for the simple boundary conditions that give you no normal modes, we know the analytic solution, so check your numerical solution against the analytic solution for the normal modes. And then play a little bit. From your graph, see if you can estimate what the speed of the wave is just by seeing how these peaks are moving with time. If it's a traveling wave, it's easier. Compare that to the analytic expression we derive for the speed, the square root of the tension over rho. Okay? What you have to do is choose your initial conditions carefully so that it's a single normal mode. So here's an example of one that should give you a normal mode. And then <coughs> repeat. Uh, these plots, but now try to see if you can get beating. See if you have two normal mode conditions. Do they both continue? Do they add up and give you like something like a beat? Well, you know, normally beats are when the frequencies are very close to each other. Does it look like a beat when they're separated by a normal mode? Okay. And then we showed you a pluck at the end of the string. What happens if you pluck it in the middle? You should get a standing wave, but it also is actually two traveling waves in either direction should be evident, canceling and interfering with each other. So, see if that's what happens. So, these are now your assessments. I think it's time you now should go to the lab, get the program running, and test it. Next time we'll talk about some enhancements. So, see you soon. Bye-bye.